So uh, I've got Hermes here with me. He does at least one to two splices a day, every day. Um, so he's definitely an expert. So we're gonna go ahead and, uh, and splice this piece of belt. So first thing we'll do is uh, we'll, we'll just assume that the belt is locked out and slack is pulled and all energy is isolated. And then we're gonna go ahead and measure the belt and get the, get the get marks on the belt to cut it square. So what Hermes is gonna do here is he's gonna find, he's gonna find a center seven. point on the belt. And uh, what, is seven? What, what makes it real easy is what Hermes is doing there, just going at an angle till he gets to a whole number. And he's going across the belt and he's going until it says exactly 48. Your belt is typically not gonna be an exact measurement but uh, it makes it a lot easier to find your center if you just pull it until you get to a, uh, to a whole number that's easy to divide by. And no matter what the angle is, center is still, still center. Center, center. Yeah. Once you find your center point, you can pick a number. Hermes has chosen 34, and then he swings his tape measure over until it touches the belt. You want to be on the same side mm -hmm. of the tape measure when you yeah. go to mark it. The inside's a lot better. Yep, inside your tape. And then you'll swing it over to the other side. Like it. And then we'll mark this. Up. We will uh, now grab a belt cutting knife and we'll place it underneath the belt. So you can see the knife, there's a, there's a grip tape edge and an edge without grip tape. We want this side towards the, the side that we want to splice. Another thing to look for as soon as you're putting the knife on, there's a, there's a window in the top of these templates, or on the top of these knives, and you can see where the blade is, or you can look in and see where the blade is. The blade's on my side, Hermes. Mm -hmm. So we'll pull the, pull the knife to where the edge of the knife, the base of the knife is up against the edge of the belt. Okay. All right, Hermes, we'll get this lined up. We're just lining up the top of the knife with the yellow marks that we have on the belt. Okay, so we have the edge of our marks right on the edge of our knife. We know it's straight. Um, this, uh, these knives are made for multiple different sizes of belt. If you have a very narrow piece of belt and a really long knife, you don't want to over tighten these because what you'll do is you'll bow the top of these knives. And they don't have to be extremely tight, just snugged up. The other thing is the blade has to be pulled. It's on a bicycle chain and as you twist the knob on either end, it pulls it one direction. If you want to pull the blade, you never want to push it with the bicycle jam. You don't want any pressure put on either side of this belt. If I was to get up and walk across this belt while Hermes was cutting, you can pull that belt out of the knife and, and it will throw a, a crooked cut on your belt. And when you throw that crooked cut on the belt, then you can't get a good splice across your belt either. So anytime you get a template or anything clamping on the belt, stay off of it as you're cutting it, and that'll help you straighten it out. Another thing that helps make a straight cut is having your belt lay flat. A lot of times we're trying to do this in structure, and the belt structure has a curve to it, and if you're too close to those curved up rollers, you'll cut, you'll cut a bad cut, and it won't be straight across the edge of the belt. So the flatter you can have your belt on each side, and then have no pressure on it, the straighter your cut is, which starts your splice off good. Okay, go ahead and finish up. Always pull your knife all the way to the end, because then it puts the blade inside of the cover at the end, so that when you take the top off, there's no chance of cutting yourself. Let's go ahead and loosen the top. Once the belt's cut, you don't have to take the top all the way off, you just slide the top off. Most of the time we'll end up splicing the belt on the bottom belt of the conveyor system and that puts the pole side of the belt towards the ground. This belt is a two ply and it has, it has two ply of fabric and there's rubber on each side 
and uh, the side facing the ground may be just a tiny bit thicker, but a lot of our conveyor belts have a pronounced thicker side than the other side, and that is the coal side of the belt. So we're going to assume that the coal side is down, a lot like it is at, at most of our splice stations and most of the places we do splices at. So we're going to show you just like it would be in real, in a normal scenario. So we'll set our template up approximately a foot, foot uh, about two feet back from the edge of the belt. Hold the belt over, move it up into the template. As it comes in the template, what we're trying to do is let it butt up against these pins that are on the front of the template. Um, as you notice, me and Hermes are putting our knees on the back of this belt. If we take our knees off, um, sometimes the edge of the belt will touch the pins, but the center is not touching the pins. So what we're going to do is when we push on the belt with our knee, it takes it up to the center of that pin or it takes the center of the belt to the pin, which allows, <clears throat> allows us to get a good sky on the belt and keep everything straight and aligned. Sometimes it's necessary to hold down on the belt as you're doing this so it doesn't pop up and go over the pins. So as you see Hermes and I put our hands up here, hold it down, and then push on it with our knee to push it up against the pins on the template. And then we'll go ahead and tighten up the template. Now, the template is just like the knife. It is not something that has to be extremely tight. It is not a vice. We're just snugging it up. And the same thing happens to these templates, especially on, on narrower belt, than the actual template itself, is you crank these things down and then the template bows up. And then as you splice, this center can work out because these teeth are no longer touching the belt in the middle, which this is really good. We're up against the pins all the way. It's a nice clean edge. Um, the next thing Hermes is going to do is buzz this corner with his knife. When Hermes is doing this, there's no one in the way. He keeps his other hand back. He doesn't, if, if anything, you can hold the knife with two hands. That way you make sure that your other hand is out of the way the whole time. What Hermes is doing right here is he's cutting a little corner of the belt off of the cover so he can determine on where he wants to set the skyver. So he's going to trim just the rubber off which is going to allow him to look at where the cover of the belt stops and the cords start. And he's going to be able to uh, set his skyver at that point. All right, so what Hermes is going to start out by doing is loosening up the table and the blade. There's two separate adjustments on these skyvers. And then there's two separate holes for the table. So the, the blade adjusts on the table, and then the table adjusts on the skyver frame itself. So Hermes, looses, Hermes loosened everything up so it can be free and slide up and down. And then he's going to take it over on his belt and start setting it up. Go ahead, Hermes. So he raises the table and the blade up, trams it over to his belt, and then he's going to let the table set down tight on the belt. And then he tightens up the table. Then he's looking at his blade right now, and he's setting his blade depth. Sometimes. These, uh, these skyvers can be a little difficult. You'll see some dents in the top of them, and people will push on them with their screwdriver here to help push down and get that blade depth set correctly. Um, typically with the new skyver and good belt, you won't have to do that, but a lot of times we don't have new belt and new skyvers that we're working with. So Hermes has it set where he thinks he likes it. He took it right to the top of the fabric. Um, we want to take the rubber right to the edge of the fabric. We don't want to cut any of the fabric when we go to do this sky. Go ahead, Ernest, and see how it turned out. So what Hermes is looking for here is he's looking to see, he took some rubber up. Right back here where he cut with his knife, you can see that the cords are actually exposed. Now, you can't see the wave of the cords here, so we could probably go just a little bit deeper, but um, we don't want to be cutting the cords like he did with his knife here. So go ahead and run all the way across from us, then we'll back up and reset it and, uh, and, and, and take that down just a little bit more. Like I was saying before, anytime you set it and you start, go ahead and run all the way across the belt. 
for one, some of our belt has um, swollen spots in it from water, and we don't want to we don't want to cut a bunch of cords because there were swollen spots. You can see this belt even has mm -hmm. one ply that drifts up a little bit here. There's a little bit of drift up in it, and you can see the the wrinkles of the cords through the rubber. So I think we're going to call it good there. That's what I'm saying. Yeah, I think you're just fine. I don't think we'll take that any deeper. We want a little rubber protection. The cords are where all your strength is. So what we want to do is countersink these clips so when they're going over the scrapers, they're not getting beat up or whether they're hitting a seized up roller or let's say a roller goes out and it's hitting the bottom frame or something. We don't want this, these clips to get tore up. So we're countersinking those clips to give them a little protection as the belt runs. <clears throat> so remember, this is going to buzz that front edge of this guy one more time. There, it leaves a little bit of a hump. Just, uh, just the way the tools are designed and the way the equipment works. It leaves just a little bit of a hump of rubber right there on the front edge. So he's going to clean that up with his razor knife again. You can see here he's using two hands on it so he has no chance of cutting his, his non-use hand. He holds the knife pretty flat and just trims for any humps along that front edge. We have these plastic gauges and they have a bunch of different sizes on them. So what we'll do is we can take these plastic gauges and we can run over here and we've got this one that fits over the edge of the belt and it says go on it. And our, our clip size needs to be a U37 then. So there's a no-go, which the no-go does not go on there. The go does go on there. This is before you skive or, or a piece of belt that has not been skived. You can test this thickness of your belt. Um, so we need the U37 clips. We have a lot of different options in our warehouse and we'll go over that after the splice is done, what the difference in those clips are and our different options that we have. So now that we're prepped, we'll go ahead and scoot the belt back in the template. We know we need U37s to put on this, to put the splice on. We'll loosen up the template. Come to this side. Um, as you watch, me and Hermes are putting a hand on the belt so we can push with our thumb and we'll rock the template forward just slightly and we take it to where the belt's just past the back of the holes and then we'll let the template rest back down and that lets the back row of, of teeth bite back into that belt so nothing moves unexpectedly and we don't lose it out of the template and have to start all over. As I said, our, our clips are U37s. Um, some of these will say for 60 inch belt. That's fine, that's just the quantity they have in the box. If you need to do 72 inch belt or 48 inch belt, as long as the thickness matches the clip dimensions, you can use these, you just won't use as many out of the box. All right, so me and Hermes will start this. Um, on 60 inch belt and smaller, we always start with and we go two holes and then we start our clips. There's a, so that's how they go in, they go in staple first, these clips have a staple, and then the clip, so then we'll go with the next one. You always want to start in a full hole, we don't ever want to half hole them. I've seen that done and that causes a lot of issues, so we need to make sure it starts on a full hole. Okay, so when we get to here, uh, probably, like this one won't fit, it doesn't look like it will fit. So we can just trim off one of these clips, you take it and twist it, and there's a copper wire that's welded to these clips. Take it, twist it back and forth, and you always watch for this copper piece that may be sticking out. If that copper piece is sticking out, you want to trim it off so it doesn't, uh, doesn't get in your way and cause you issues. And these set in the template. I always run my hand down them and fill them because sometimes there'll be one that's a little high and you'll fill that as you run your hand back and forth. And you kind of want to make sure that they wiggle around a little bit. You don't want them super stiff, like you have to feed them in and they're not overly tight. You make sure that things look uh, copacetic and we don't want to have a big wave in them. We don't want to have a box that got hit by a truck or something and then you have, um, so, if you have some clips that are mashed down or something like that, twisted, sometimes you'll see something like this in a template. 
and you'll know that you'll know that that's not a good issue. You don't want that in your splice. It won't work well for you. We'll clear all of our stuff. Me and Hermes will go around the other side of the template, and we'll push the belt into these clips. When me and Hermes push the belt in, we're focusing in on these copper clips, and we're getting the belt to slide up tight to that copper pin. So that's what we'll be doing next is sliding the belt in, making sure it's tied up against the copper pin. And you can shove it in so far that it bulges past that copper pin, which makes for a really strong splice, but it's almost impossible to get a pin in afterwards. We'll grab the bottom of the template and we're gonna rock the template forward, which changes our angle of the template to match the angle of our belt. And that should allow us to slide it right in the clips. Ready? Okay. You got one? You got one? I've got a hole, I got two holes that I'm covering with the belt. So what we're doing now is make one and a half. Yeah. We're making sure that our belt is covering the same amount of holes past our clips. Our clip is here. I'm feeling underneath the template. I'm touching the edge of the staple. And then I'm counting one and a half holes and I start seeing my finger past the edge of the belt. Hermes is doing the same thing on his side. That's assuring us that the belt is center in the clips and that we don't have the belt farther to one side than the other inside of the clips. So another thing we're gonna check, just like when we were skiving, as we look in the middle, make sure that we're not getting what we call a smiley. We're a little bit off the pins in the middle, same scenario, we put a little knee in it and it pushes it right in. And on the edges, we wanna make sure that we're not over the pin, over the copper pin. I'm looking at this copper pin. We don't want to be past it. It will stop us from getting our pin in the splice when we go to uh, breathe the splice together. Okay, tighten it up. All right. Once again, let's just snug them up. Make sure the teeth are biting in the belt. Don't overdo it on your handles. Don't over tighten the template. You will bow the top and make it uh, make it not useful in the future. So the, the wave cable, we want to come to the edge of the belt, and uh, you can do this a couple different ways, but I like running the wave close to the edge of the belt. I go through the first hole I can, down, and then I come back up with the weight. Is that how you usually do it also, Hermes, or do you go all the way to the end? You do it close to the belt, maybe two away. Okay. Hermes is doing the splice, so we'll run it the way he likes it. And he's saying what he does is he puts it a little ways away from the edge of the belt because this cable gets real tight and it's hard to move it if you don't have it, um, if you have it too close to the edge of the belt. And if you put it too far away, it moves too much and then you have to continuously adjust it. So we just pull that tight, it stays in there. Hermes will go to his end and he just kind of pulls it snug and uh, he, can, he can pull it tight and that pulls it between these two holes. We have a, a front row staple and a back row staple, and the cable goes right in between those all the way along the splice. Um, so we're going to set up our lacing head. These lacing heads have this brass block, or it looks like brass block on the side of it. This, uh, this block is a gauge, and from this table depth here to the brass block, if it, is, has, if it has 37 facing up, that gives you the distance the thickness of your belt, that gives you a really good starting point on where your lacing head needs to be. Now that's not exact and that's not perfect for every time, but that gives you a really good base point and how you adjust that is with this knob here. And tighten is tighten and loosen is loosen. So that as I turn this, you can see this brass block moves down and it makes it tighter. And if I turn it the other way, it makes it looser. We'll go over a couple things when Hermes gets started. Um, so you turn it to 37, you check your depth, and then you put the pin in the lacing head. This allows you to do only half of uh, the first stage of the clips. And the first stage is shoving the staples up through. We didn't have any of one of those clips out of that box. There's a plunger on the bottom of this lacing head, and the plunger comes up and it pushes two staples at a time up and into the holes and pushes them up. And that's our first stage. And then we'll come back and we'll fold those staples over. So Hermes is gonna go first and he's gonna punch the staples up and through the splice. 
Go ahead, Hermes, let's see if uh, you're happy with where you're at. Um, one of the things we want to do when we're putting the air on, uh, a real common problem is guys will put the air hose on and they'll push this mason head and it will run into those staples on the bottom and bend the first staple. So you'll start your splice with a, a challenging situation and your staples messed up and it will start there and it will carry throughout your entire splice. I'm going to put some uh, earplugs in real quick because this lace and gets an air tool. Hermes is just sliding the lace and head along the template. You can just push it sideways at that point. There's two handles on this machine. Um, one handle causes the, the actuation to run this and the other handle is a it's a cog that comes up and helps it scoot over each time the handle comes down. All right, Hermes, go ahead and let's set the first clip and see if you like the settings it's at. Okay, so the first stage is, the first little bit is a, a pre-bend. And he started that staple and he pre-bent it. A lot of times guys will take the lace and all the way over and they try mashing the staples through right at the beginning. He's doing the pre-bend, then he's going to mash the staples through. Go ahead. All right, he got the first set of staples through, back the lacing head up so the camera can see it. So he went ahead and popped the staples through. Hermes uh, is, is looking at it, evaluating it. This clip is pre-bent, and this one has not been touched yet. So when you push the staples through, it pre-bends the clip next to it. So Hermes has set that up. What do you think, Hermes? Do you I like that? Good. I think it's a good depth also. So he's going to go ahead and run all the way across these clips just pushing the staples through. If you look over here on this side of the lacing head, this is the handle that you have, you have to have this handle down and this handle down to back up. Going forward, this, you can just move it forward. And then to actuate it, you have to hold the handle up against the air actuator. Um, you have to hold it against the air actuator until the lacing head goes through its full cycle. Because you can start it, and then let off and go to scoot over and then you'll damage your clips. It has to be held until it stops, then it can come down and go to the next clip. So you hold it down until it stops, then you go to the next clip. So you'll see that as Hermes goes along this splice, he's going to take it up, hold it until it comes to its full stroke, and then he'll let off. You can go, you can short stroke it and stop too early a lot of times and, uh, and then scoot over before the lacing head is done doing its job. Go ahead and start out, Hermes, we'll see how it goes. down here you can see underneath of the the lacing head you can see right there where the wave cable is at and see that it's between the two staples and that's what Hermes is watching as he's going the other thing that he's watching is making sure this jaw is coming up high enough before he scoots over so he doesn't damage any of the clips on the other side of it So Hermes made it all the way to the end of the belt. On his first stage, he's going to back up a little ways and he's going to set up his second stage. So part of the second stage is pulling the pin. So he's going to pull the pin out. And then he's going to loosen the lacing head. How many turns do you loosen it, Hermes? Like uh, seven quarters. Seven quarter turns. Two, three, four, five, six, seven. Okay, so he loosens it, takes the pin out. And he didn't start all the way over at the beginning. Um, our, our edges of our belt take the most beatings and the most, most uh, tension. So what we always do is we start back a little ways. 
That way, if we mess up or we're not getting it quite right, we can make an adjustment before we get to the really crucial clips that are out on the edges where they get beat by structure and uh, red iron and stuff like that. Go ahead, Hermes, and see if that field looks as good. So he did a good fold on that. The, the, the staples folded over. They're in the channel. So there's a channel that countersinks those staples. They're not all the way at the end of that channel and they're not sticking up still. And you also see there's no big scrape marks on the top of these. A lot of times if it's too tight, the lacing head will scrape the top of these and they'll see some burrs coming up and the lacing head will make a lot of banging and clunking noises as you do that. So the, it sounded pretty smooth. The, the top of the clip looks good. We're, we're countersunk in the groove, but we're not overly countersunk. So I think we're in good shape. Hermes, what do you think? Yeah, we're good. All right. Hermes is going really fast here because he's used to doing it. It's, it's a natural rhythm for him. Go ahead and hold it up till it stops, Hermes. It comes to a stop, then he's letting off. And, uh, sometimes at the speed that he's doing that, you can't see that it's getting all the way to a stop because it goes on so quickly. But uh, that's what that machine's doing. It's going all the way to the top, stopping, and then he's letting off and moving on to the next, sta next staple. Go ahead. Hermes has completed the splice. Um, a lot of times we'll measure for center at this point and, and we'll, uh, we'll pull center to see, to mark it before we let it out of the template because it's nice and flat. It's up out of the dirt or mud or wherever you're working at. And uh, we'll make a center mark on it. I'm 45 and three quarters. Just cut it through the two. Yeah, we check it through the two. And then we'll pull this way and go 22. And then you can just count count center it off of that. That's the simplest way to do it. So pull the same measurement both ways, and then you can count uh, count clips in between. Then you make sure you're centered. Uh, Hermes is going to paint this as far down as he can because when we flip this out, we need to be able to see it. We're going to mark the other side because. Um, it's not marked yet either. Four and five and four, so same way. Yeah. Two, the same way. Two. Two. Yeah. Yeah. There we go. So then they're marked, and. Uh, we're ready to put this thing together. We'll take it out of the template. Um, I'll show you on the gauge one more thing. The, the gauge is the term for pin size also. Um, we only have two different sizes of pin here at 20 mile. Underground, we only use one size of pin. There's, and it's the biggest pin that we have. And that's the only pin we use underground. On the surface, there is different size clips. So sometimes you need a different size pin. And as you see, the gauge has a gauge for pins also. So if your pin fits in there and it's, and it's snug, you got the right pin. Um, if you tried using the big pin that, uh, that we have, the other big pin that we have in this splice, it would be very difficult to get it in the clips and then it would wear the clips out quickly because it would be too tight of a hinge pin. So we're going to use this pin for this, this splice 
and this is where it goes in. You can check it on the gauge. The gauge corresponds to your clips. You know you had U37, so then you know what kind, what size of pin to use. This one has two different options, but this pin fits it good, so we know what pin to use. We'll set it out here. So we'll take it out of the template. Um, I might need your help, Levi, to stand on the back of these belts, so when we go to put them together, they don't they don't slip out. So we'll take this out of the template. So ideally, when you put these belts across, you want them to cover each other about six inches. And then, uh, in, in a real scenario, we wouldn't need any, any counterweight here because the belt's long and it would be back quite a ways. Uh, we'll probably put some counterweight on this side too, so it doesn't. And basically in between it, we'll uh, line up our yellow marks. Scoot over just a little bit. There we go. Line up our yellow marks. Tap it gently with the hammer. So I'm going to grab a couple of these clips so I can show you what we're looking for. As these clips um, mate, you want enough room for the pin to go in, and if it's too high, it's almost impossible to get a pin in, and if it's too flat, it doesn't let the pin go in as well, because there's a, there's a happy angle, and we call it a teepee. And we always talk about having the right teepee to get the pin in, and that allows that, that circle where the hinge pin can go in the splice. So we've got a teepee here, our teepee's too tight right now, and we've got a, a spot that the pin is not going to be able to fit in. Um, you could probably force it in, and you could drive it in and beat on it for hours and get it to go in. What we're going to do is we're going to take our teepee down and make that make that hole for the pin a little better. So we'll let Levi we'll have, we'll take this belt out just a little bit. Let's we'll push down on it just a smidge. Right there, right. How do you like that, Hermes? Okay. So these pins have have a welded end on them that keeps the sheathing on the pin. And if you want, if you think ahead of where your splice station is and where you splice all the time, you want room to pull the pin out next time you do the splice. So if you have a wall or rib or equipment on that side all the time, you want to shove the pin in and then cut it off on that side or cut it off on this side so you can pull the, the cut in out all the time. But, uh, here we're just going to assume that sometimes it helps to give the pin a little spin. So we yep. want the pin to hang out just a little bit. We don't want it to hang out past the edge of the belt. <clears throat> Another thing we didn't talk about is we're assuming that this belt is traveling in this direction, which means that this, this is a safe splice because the clips are wider on this side than they are on this side. If we had this opposite and we had one clip wider on the trailing edge, we would want to either take the pin out and cut it off or get a hacksaw and cut that off 
but we don't want any clips wide on the trailing edge because if it is rubbing something, we want it to skip past the splice and keep rubbing the belt without damaging our belt splice. Once you get the pin in the splice, we'll get some clip cutters. And then we'll taper these corners back to protect that edge of that belt so it doesn't hang up on anything when we're uh, if the belt was to rub anything. thing we do is, uh, do you have a carver on you, Hermes? No. No? Um, so we typically like to put the date in the splices. We have some carving tools. Um, you can do it with a knife also. So it's, uh, so you could put a four. You can just carve a little piece in the belt. And this helps, um, helps us keep track of how long splices are lasting. If you have a splice wear out in a week, you know you got something hung up in your conveyor system causing that splice to wear out prematurely. So there's a splice start to finish, deciding what clips to use, um, some of the lacing heads, some of the normal techniques that we do to, to do a splice.